Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery. My name is Keely Orgeman. I'm the Assistant Curator of American Paintings and Sculpture uh, at the gallery, and also the curator of Lumia, Thomas Wilfred and the Art of Light, which is the exhibition on view on the fourth floor just off the central elevator. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon, the acclaimed multimedia artist, Joshua White. When we began thinking about programming to <laughs> accompany the Lumia exhibition, uh, I immediately thought of Joshua, who is the creator of the legendary Joshua Light Show. I am thrilled that he has now given the exhibition his stamp of approval, having visited twice. And today we have the great privilege of hearing his insightful perspective on the art of Thomas Wilfred. Joshua studied theatrical lighting and filmmaking in college before developing a passion for light shows and slide projections. In the 60s, Joshua started designing light environments for the first generation of New York's discos, as well as improvised projections in live concert venues. In 1967, he founded the Joshua Light Show, a group of artists that performed abstract, multichromatic, giant scale projections before live audiences. The Joshua Light Show were resident artists at the Fillmore East Rock Club in New York City and performed behind major artists of the time, including Janis Joplin, Frank Zappa, and Jimi Hendrix, just to name a few. More recently, the Joshua Light Show has been featured in installations, installations and performances at the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Skirball Center in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design in Detroit, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Tate Liverpool, plus many, many other venues. I hope many of you had a chance to experience the immersive comp compilation of video work in light and sound that Joshua put together for our program last night. Today, he will share with us stories of how Thomas Wilfred's Lumia have played a critical role in the genesis and evolution of the Joshua Light Show, now in its 50th year. Joshua, thank you for being here today to deliver your lecture after Wilfred, The L Influence of Lumia on the Joshua Light Show. I have, to, I have to get up slowly now after that introduction. It, uh, it, it uh, makes me feel like I've been around a long time, but I guess I have, have been around a long time. Not long enough to know how to get a microphone out of the way. Okay, anyway, uh, thank, you, thank you all, uh, all for coming. Uh, basically, I'm just going to, uh, can you hear me by the way? Yes, okay. I'm just going to run, um, just run th through things sometimes very quickly in order to leave a little bit of time so that we might be able to take some, some questions. But, but thank, you, thank you all for coming. Uh, my, uh, my wife, Bridget, and I are new to PowerPoint, and so we have to take a moment to get it to do what we want it to do. But there it is. OK. This begins 2,000 years ago. No, I, I won't do that. But this is, uh, I, I just love, I, I wanted to just give you a sampling of how old some of these ideas are. Uh, 18, 1874. Now let's just jump forward 10, 10 years. 1893. This is uh, essentially before electri electricity. Ale uh, Alexander Remington developed a thing called the color organ. Uh, I've never actually seen one working. I've seen pictures of them. I've, I think there was a re recreation in one show, but basically it. Uh, it Light came out of here and played the keys. The point was he was trying, searching like we all are, to find some way to interpret music. Let's jump forward in time to 1942. Uh, <clears throat> I was born. <laughs> and and that, that's my mother. <laughs> my mother, she's so pretty. And she turned 100 today. Mom. And, uh, and, and she still is feisty as ever. OK, uh, but I was a happy baby. And, uh, and, and, and basically, I was, I was a, a, happy, uh, a happy kid. You know, I mean, I got to ride my pony around on the Upper East Side where we lived. And, and didn't everybody have a pony? Uh, 
I, I loved having my father wake me up taking a flash photograph, uh, and, uh, and I was a, a happy camper. Uh, but in, um, and, and I was also, I had friends, and I was fairly well adjusted, and I was fashionable. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was well liked, and my life was fairly easy, and, and it was the 50s, and it was, was, life was nice, you know, it was the 50s, exactly what you imagine. Everything was in black and white, and I did wonderful uh, things uh, with my hair, we all did. And the only sort of thing in my life that was really, uh, really scarred me uh, was this. My father. My father supported the family very well. We lived very comfortably. We were not without, I could have what I wanted for whatever I wanted to do. Not within, all within reason. Uh, but it was a thing called the Pinky Lee Show. And my father owned the Pinky Lee Show. He stayed, lived in New York. The show was produced in California. I don't think he went out more than two two weeks a year, but he, it was his show. And uh, 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 some of you are too old to remember the Pinky Lee show, and <laughs> some of you are too young. But let's take a, just a quick look so you get some sense. My silly dance like a bully ghost. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> this was the thing that, that, that hung, hung over me uh, when I was a kid. And here's why. Because Pinky was, uh, was on television in uh, six days a week, six hours a week. And what Pinky was in real life was Pincus Leff, a burlesque uh, comic uh, who often uh, played the ca a character called the Nance in a burlesque comedy. Uh, he was the sort of light on his toes one. Uh, and, and he was the, the one who did all the, it was always the guy that got beaten up in, in some of the old burlesque sketches. You know, can you tell me the way to Flugel Street? Flugel Street? Slowly I turn. My wife was murdered on Flugel Street. I hate Flugel Street. And they keep repeating that over and over again. He's the guy that keeps getting, getting beaten up. That was burlesque comedy. It was a little dirtier, but they cleaned it up for television. They just changed it uh, and did it as sketch, sketches for kids. But uh, but it was it was it was kind of it was just kind of difficult because every day somebody would come up to me and and with no genuine meanness just kid meanness would say hey Josh how's Pinky bam right on the arm so so I began uh, it wasn't that I needed to hide from it but 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 I began to uh, to realize that that there, I needed to have something more that there was I, I needed to have something in my life. Uh, so I just, I just tried everything. I was, uh, one year I, was, I did model railroads, one year it was puppetry, one year it was magic, one year it was radio, I liked to, to pretend that I was doing radio shows, uh, and, it was, and filmmaking. And I picked up a set of, of skills as a, really as a teenager from what limited sources I could pick them up from. But um, I did uh, eventually, uh, uh, a, a, a wonderful magic thing happened to me, which was that I failed um, social studies, which was a, private school name for history. I failed it in, uh, in the 11th grade and had to take tutoring. And it just meant on Saturdays I'd have to go somewhere and sit for three hours with, with, uh, with a tutor, and then I was fine. Um, but what happened was that the tutoring was on 3rd Avenue and 46th Street, and on the corner, again, this is in the 50s, there was a store called Walters Electric. And Walters Electric was a supplier of lighting and lighting equipment for anybody, for contractors, everybody. Uh, I could never get there uh, during the week, but after, uh, but before, it was open from 8 a.m. to noon on Saturday, so I could get an hour in before tutoring. That's where they sold colored light bulbs. That's where they sold all of the things that, that I learned then that I, I, still, I still know how, uh, how to do. And it was, it was very important because it turned me on to light, and I ended up, in the background, you can see me, with a light. At school, I ended up sort of being a follow spot operator and whenever possible designing something. And I, and I did the school dances, which basically meant I take out the light bulbs from the fixtures and stick in red light bulbs. And everybody thought I was a genius. So <laughs> it's fi fine with me. But when I was, uh, when I was a, a, a kid, and, and when I was like 15 or so, my parents got me a student membership to the Museum of Modern Art. Now, this was not so much about my parents wanting me to have this great art experience as much as 
It was $15. And what you could do, and this, by the way, this is the, is the Museum of Modern Art from my childhood. Don't confuse it with the Museum of Modern Art of today, which is a massive institution. Uh, you could sort of still see the, the old building. Let me put it in reference from the other angle. Uh, you could see how tiny it was. And, uh, and, but if you look at it as I saw it as, as a kid, it was, uh, it, it was only six stories high. And, uh, and up on top, they had what was called the, the member's restaurant. And as a member, I could get in for free, and I could take the elevator upstairs to the member's restaurant. Now, I had a choice each day. I could either go to the corner um, with my friends and have a Coke and cherry pie, or I could come to the Museum of Modern Art, go upstairs to the restaurant, which was really a cafeteria, and have Coke and cherry pie. And, and I did, uh, once or twice a week, depending on what train came into the station, I would take the train that took me right there. Sometimes I'd bring a girlfriend with me. Uh, it, was a, 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 it was a great thing to do. Uh, and it was very empowering to be so young. And I would go upstairs, have my Coke and cherry pie, and walk down. And, and I walked down past just some of the, the great art and looked at everything, but this was like my pals. I would see them once a week. Picasso's Guernica was there then. There was, there was Van Gogh's and Gauguin's. You notice how I said Van Gogh. Uh, that's, uh, is that, that's right, isn't it, Van Gogh? Yes, OK. Uh, and, uh, and, and got into big arguments with, uh, with one of my girlfriends, Minda, about why the Rothkos were good. And she actually convinced me why they were good. I just looked at them like most people do, as a big nothing uh, on nothing. But she explained, and then I got it. And of course, Jackson, Jackson Pollock. The, um, the, 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 there was something when I got downstairs to the, I can't remember if it's the basement or the ground floor. It was a very small piece, but it was against a black wall, and it was uh, the first Thomas Wilfred. And you have to imagine what it was like to, to come upon something like this in the 50s. And as you got closer and closer to it, it just took you in. And I would spend hours in front of this thing, which just always changed. And I never, um, I never knew how he did it. I, I appreciated the fact that, the, that MoMA supported Wilfred both th then and later. They really gave him major, major works to see. Uh, but I, just, uh, I was just fascinated with it. And I really began at that point to realize that light, everything else was good and I could use everything, but light was really what, what turned me on. And uh, it was just a, a visual experience. I, of course, wanted to know how he did it. But everything was locked up. You could, this was in a wall, and you couldn't get behind the wall. So I never knew how he did it. I wanted to know how he did it, but I was happy at that point to just see what it, what it looked like. And it, it helped guide me towards lighting, I mean formal lighting. And I went to, uh, as I went, in, I graduated from high school, and I went to Carnegie, Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon University, <clears throat> where I learned all of the craft of theater as it was taught in in those days, which was basically an academy. So you learned, um, you learned all kinds of things, like fly galleries with rope and uh, uh, making things out of uh, 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 paper mesh or papier mache. Never paper mache. <laughs> Had to be pa papier mache. And and modern materials like styrofoam and all the things that were to come along, we just just weren't there then. Uh, but at least nobody came up to me and said, "Pow." on the arm, House Pinky. So I was, I was in good shape, and I was absorbing, um, I was absorbing the, 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 I was absorbing the theater crafts, and, and some, to some degree, knowledge of theater. But the, it was very academic, and it was very uh, old fashioned, and I wasn't really ultimately that interested. Uh, but, but while I was there, I, uh, call, I called upon my old, uh, some of my old things that I was fascinated with, like ra radio shows. I did radio shows. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I'll show you a nice picture, uh, uh, this, this cute, cute girl. You can see in this picture, she, oh, go backwards, thank you. <laughs> go, back, go forwards. <coughs> see, she's looking at me. She's looking at me. <laughs> and uh, we, we were uh, good friends, Bridget Smith is her name, and we uh, did, proje <laughs> did projects together at, at school. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, we had separate lives, uh, but we sort of knew what was going on in each other's lives. But um, uh, six years ago, Bridget and I hooked up again, and she's been my wife. Bridget, Bridget is here. Just pe peek outside and let them just see you. Okay. Uh, but she's wa she's wonderful, and only Bri and the reason we're doing a PowerPoint is because Bridget could pick it up. I couldn't. I was also a photographer, a cheerleader, 
that's me in the suit. Uh, I, was, uh, I was really anxious after my freshman year at school to go to, um, to, to work in summer stock. It seemed so romantic and sexy, and it was everything about summer stock. You're all living together. But no, uh, my father <clears throat> was now producing uh, television shows of circuses in Europe starring Don Amici. And I was uh, pressed into service as the cue card boy. Uh, and we had, we just, it was terrible. We had to travel all over Europe first class. <clears throat> and I had to make cue cards. And then he'd stand in front of the circus. And then they would record, uh, record the circus. I, I, did on the, I did, however, develop a lovely style which I believe any of the people I work with now would love to copy and imitate. So I, I was able to be very stylish uh, in, in, 19, in the early 60s. But that was, uh, that, was, that was my basic training. But I did learn a lot about TV production, enough to know that I wasn't that interested in the theater. So I went to USC film school. Now, USC film school, it was a similar problem to, to Carnegie Tech in that they taught uh, basically an academy-type program, and all of the teachers were people that had graduated uh, from USC Film School, which is not a good sign. And, <coughs> and they taught you a lot of what I call arcane arts. In, at, at Carnegie Tech, it was about Elizabethan theater. At, at USC, it was about how to make films in the 40s and 50s. So I learned things that, that I, I can't believe I learned, just how to make 23-page budgets, how to deal with extras and how to load cameras. One of the things that I can do is I can, I can load that Mitchell camera with my eyes closed. That was a skill that I picked up there, which would be of use to me later. I'll tell you about it. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it was just before the new wave. It was a couple of years before Steven Spielberg and all those people went to USC film school. It was just not, not that interesting or good. So after two years, I did something that nobody does. I dropped out. And, uh, and I still had my filmmaking skills, and I also now was learning about what else was available out there. And there were these wonderful French silent cameras that you could go and shoot. And the whole idea of documentary with, on 60 millimeters was just coming into, into vogue then. And I, I could do it. So that was a, something I could use to earn a living while I tried to get back into the light. I also learned as a cinematographer how to look. It's not about the exposure. It's about the light. It's how does it look? And, uh, so I came back to New York in 1964, which was a very interesting year. Why? Well, for one thing, the Beatles came to America. And that was the official beginning of the 60s. Because before that, 1961, 60, 61, 60, 60 it was the 50s. But when the Beatles came to America, appearing on the Ed Sullivan show, everything changed. And the whole sensibility of what people wanted was, was different. Uh, they felt it, but they didn't know what it was. And they were definitely held back by all the mores of the 50s and the war and everything that preceded this. But I, I found a few places where I got particular input. It's not a full perspective of the 60s, but for me, the 60s, I went to the World's Fair. Uh, I had a friend uh, who worked there so I could get in. I very much appreciated the, the architecture and the way things were done. I was very into that because good old corporations, they were there to spend millions of dollars to build theaters where people could look at IBM's uh, view of the future on multiple screens and multimedia. It was, it was kind of wonderful. So I learned a lot uh, from that. And, uh, but, but meanwhile, the 60s are beginning to come up to speed. I, I'm a little vague about the, be a little vague about the dates, but my point is, is solid. Life magazine suddenly acknowledges kinetic art. They call it, of course, LSED art because they're part of the old guard trying to define the new. Uh, and this is a, a, one of the early uh, projectors projected on a, uh, on a very buff artist. And, uh, but it's not, it's not a real picture. It, the light didn't come out of his forehead. It's a double exposure. But it was the cover of Life magazine, so therefore it was true. Uh, and <laughs> The, uh, there was other things that defined the 60s, and this is one word that's always in my mind because, the, again, the, the public and the people wanted something, and the, the people that were in a position to present it were kind of an old generation. I don't mean old and in the way. I just mean they didn't quite get it. So what became very popular uh, was POW and Batman. If, for those of you too old or too young, let's just take a moment to look at what passed for pop art. So you don't see action like this very often. It's just incredible. Characters, amazing characters. Yes. Hmm. That was more than enough. 
Uh, but but it, was, it was a reference point. And reference points are very important. And any light show artist, you know, no matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, someone is going to ask you about Lazarium. Uh, a very nice person um, who I just met today asked me if there was a connection between lava lamps and the light show. Yes, you, they do things, but there's no, there was no connection. It was just people were looking around for something to look at. And meanwhile, uh, artists like Andy Warhol are presenting shows that with music that was kind of okay um, uh, and his superstars. And the Warhol people were were a, a whole group that I just could not connect with. I went to the, to the various factories and things, and I met the people. But they were, they were a little older and just a little on the other side, and, and they all took amphetamine. So it was really hard to talk to one of, one of them because the breath would, would, just, would, would just, just kill you. Um, but it was considered high end. And there was people coming up with all kinds of Timothy Leary and psychedelic sessions and things. There was also low end. All the crappy old DJs were putting on these big shows in movie theaters, just like they did with Frank Sinatra and Dean and Jerry. And, and we had to suffer through that. Then there was like oversell, where, where somebody is trying to basically sell you a mirrored ball. So they take this photograph, this woman with this little teeny tiny light wearing, I don't know what she's wearing. Uh, and, and that's supposed to be what you see. Well, it's not what you see, uh, but they're overselling. Uh, or or they're, under, they're underselling, little tiny ads, turn on with a psychedelic strobe. This, but again, I wasn't offended by it. I was, I was excited by it. And also, I'm able to make a living shooting, shooting film. And when I say a living, it means I could make money shooting films. And in New York at that time, there weren't really many, many real films. The, the filmmaking in New York really got better. Uh, later, but but I was making what were called exploitation films. These were films that sort of pulled you into the theater. Uh, a girl on a chain gang. I was a teenage mother, and we'd work on them. They, they were always shot in two weeks, always shot non-union, uh, and but I I could do it. And also uh, I got to carry this camera around. And carrying this camera around was the equivalent of somebody in the later 60s walking around with a sitar. It was a sort of babe magnet thing. If you carried a camera, you had, you had a certain authority. Uh, so I, you know, that was, that was okay, but I still was looking for something. Good old industrial shows, the same people that that's willing to spend all the money on the World's Fair were willing to spend money on a very controlled version of what they considered to be something far out. They did, we couldn't use words like, like psychedelic and things because that implied drugs, so it was, we, we really would use turn on, uh, you know, and, and I was able to, uh, to, nav to navigate in that world. They, what they wanted was models to come out, uh, to appear as if the model is in photographs and then walking through the screen. And uh, because I had the disciplines, I was able to figure out how to do this, you know, setting up that morning. Uh, I realized that the model that you see on the screen does not have to be the model you see on the runway as long as the hair is the right color. These were just all things that just came naturally to me because I had been given some very solid training in, in the professional, uh, professional arts. Um, on, on top of that, uh, this, so doing, I, I could clean up. So believe it or not, that's, that's me. And I could sit there and I could talk to corporate people. And I, I was fine with that because I got to tell you, they spent money. And that, that nothing has changed. The big money and everything is still corporate. I just can't work in that world, but I'm very grateful when it comes to me. And I'm really grateful because they, so much technology has become available now because corporations want it. And when they're tired of it or on an off day, uh, me and other artists can get our hands on it. Uh, we use very simple equipment, but again, it was, it was the best we could do and nobody was doing any better. And I have a wonderful picture I always, always love that just shows a bunch of ladies at one of my shows. We have a mirrored ball and some projectors and a follow spot, and we played the cool music, and they loved it, you know. And and we got paid, so it was it was a way. I wasn't doing anything artistic yet, but I was sneaking in little little things that that I kind of found uh, exciting. Meanwhile, uh, Timothy Leary it has become like a voice of that generation, and he was doing a series of. Of, of, of lectures, I guess, where he sat cross-legged on a big stage with a sitar and a tabla player. And he had several shows. This one is Reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And the, the Indian music really did put you in a trance. But in the balcony were eight uh, light show artists, 
people I didn't know, they were older than me, they hand painted slides, they put them in slide projectors and they changed them and waved their hands in front and it went up on the projection screen behind Tim Leary and that was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen and as I sat there watching it and he went on for like two hours, uh, everything just receded and I, I was drawn into the screen, not psychedelically just because that was what I wanted to see and, and his voice and the Indian music really was, was very soothing. Uh, so I began to search for something where I could do that kind of light show. And there, there was actually, fashion was beginning to discover it now. And there were crossovers. There was a wonderful, crazed, sort of Warhol fringe uh, designer named Tiger Morse. Wait, go back, please. And they, uh, and I, my first credit, Turned on Lights by J. Wallace White. So here I am. Uh, and, but at least I was, I was beginning to, to connect what I was interested in with with what was being offered and what was, what was out there. There was also the art world was beginning to discover things. So this is kind of a wonderful, the Cosmos psychedelic, I guess that's how they spelled psychedelic in Europe, but the Cosmos psychedelic projection by Continente, uh, a, a, a complete with the Cosmos psychedelic bottle. Uh, and I said, wow, I've got to see this. So I go to the gallery to see it. There it is, the <laughs> Continente projector, which was just, you know, a little tiny projector, but you know, he, he made bigger ones. But the, the idea was, in the art world, this was what was becoming the, uh, the, the psychedelic art. This was what was becoming the, the POW turn on. People were desperate to see anything that blinked. And uh, I met a, a person named Bob Goldstein. And Bob Goldstein uh, had a loft down on Christopher Street, and he began hosting parties every weekend where he would stand at his tower of power which was basically just a big rack with some dimmers in it. And he would dance and play music, and across the room would be three screens. There's almost no photographs of this, but it's three separate screens uh, that came down, and we would project images on them, and sometimes they'd go up, and sometimes they'd come down, and I apprenticed myself to him. And I was the guy in the booth that we built in his, in his loft, and my friends worked with me, and we worked with Bob for, you know, for five months at least, and it got good. He got good press, a wham to the senses, um, but it was still a little too show busy for me. And, uh, and I was interested in abstractions. He was interested in playing downtown and showing pictures of downtowns. Literal, nothing wrong with it, but I just felt we could, we could do, do a little bit better. Meanwhile, a gallery on 57th Street opens up, uh, the Howard Wise Gallery, with a show called Lights in Orbit. And at the Lights in Orbit show, uh, I, I got to go and walk around. And it turns out that, that the woman who ran the gallery, the young woman who ran the gallery, was someone I grew up with in, uh, in, uh, in my apartment building, Jane. And Jane would let me in. And I could wander around and be alone with the works before the gallery opened. And I noticed, there he is, Wilfred. And it was a very nice piece. I, I don't remember what it was. I just remember that it was locked and I couldn't see how he did it. But I got to get a real sense of what was going on in the art world. And it wasn't necessarily for me, but I was really, I was really glad they were doing it. Now everybody is, is, is going psychedelic. Everybody is, every you know, uh, magazine is selling you something or another. Most common, it was just two lights that blinked on and off. There was another thing called a color organ, which would take a sound, and all the bass sounds would be would be red, and all the middle sounds would be uh, green, and the high sounds would be yellow. And it would flash back and forth. And people called that a light show and called it psychedelic. It wasn't, but it was, a, it was a good start. Then there was a big change, major change for me, which was the electric circus. The electric circus was, was, in theory, just another ballroom. But what they did at the electric circus was that they, they hung up stretch nylon, which hadn't been done. I mean, I had seen it in dance productions and things, but nobody had ever done it in a nightclub surrounding, which changed the shape of the room. And they did something even more interesting, which is that they brought in uh, Anthony Martin, a, a good West Coast light show artist who had been working in that scene. And, uh, and so he would fill everything with, with color and, and what have you. And the place was very exciting. It was done a little theatrically, so what they were trying to do was bring you in, entertain you, 
you know, in, in San Francisco, everybody just wandered around. But here, uh, suddenly the lights would go out and strobes would come on to electronic music. Then the lights would come back on and people would dance and the lights would go out and somebody would, would come down and do a trapeze act. It was just a little too scripted uh, for what I thought was going on at the time, but it was an important place. I also have a wonderful rare picture of what it looked like with no lights. So you can see it's just a crummy old ballroom. But they built a stage and put mirrors on it. Mirrors were very popular and did this. And it was a, it was a wonderful success. And so the people I was, was working with, uh, we wanted to go in a direction where it looked as if we could sell this in two different worlds. We could sell it in the cool world of Andy Warhol, or we could sell it corporatively. And, and so people that I got to school with, we came up with this, the Rock and Tronics, the Rock and Light Show. Uh, and of course, it didn't exist. It, 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 all it is is it's a, it's a picture we glued together. But it looks like, like we're on top of something. And if you could buy us, we will, we will deliver it to you. Uh, I, sense effects is an interesting uh, part of my memory, and I'll just talk about it for a minute. First of all, everybody called it sex offense right away. So that was a problem. Uh, but, but we also, and this was a, a, a teaching moment for me because my, my partners and I worked very hard and hired a graphic designer specifically to come up with the logo which would identify us forever, and that's the logo. Now, I've only <laughs> lately found out what it meant. Each of these arrows represents the five senses. And then there's a mandala of some sort, a yin-yang in the middle, and that's an S for sense effects. Anyway, <laughs> it, 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 it was OK. It looked good on the t-shirts. But, but I, 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 I went along with it, but it, there was something uh, bothering me. But we got some good gigs out of it, including getting to design some discotheques. And, uh, it, it, and again, they were hard to photograph, but this was a cool discotheque. I could put, if there was an extra room, I could put a ball in it painted black with holes in it, and if you moved it, the whole wall room would turn upside down. And the people really did genuinely enjoy it, and I'm, you know, you know, and I'm, prou I'm proud of, of that work. And pretty soon the bandwagon rolled. This always happens. You, I do one discotheque, and suddenly uh, tune up, turn on, and keep time, and create your own psychedelic lighting effects. Well, no, but. They say it on the poster, so it, it gets them through the door. And it's certainly a lot better than what preceded it, which was topless dancing. So at least, and, and we, would, we also were very proud that we could take, we could make a mirrored ball out of two colanders, <laughs> stick them together and put mirrors on it, and then give it a wonderful name, uh, you know, the, 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 the sense effect orbital uh, 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 time machine, and people would pay extra for it. I can't tell you that that we made great sums of money or anything, but at least we were able to, to pay the rent. Uh, we also learned that, that club people are not the same as you. They don't invest the same way. They, so they were famous for breaking everything, and we'd get those phone calls. Uh, so we were very good at building big, hollow things. There's nothing inside of here. These are night lights, and these are lights that flash on and off, and they're just switches that turn lights on and off. No dimmers, nothing fancy, no programming. But this was how we were able to uh, develop technology. I started working with some very good young engineers. We had a little shop space. Everything was much cheaper in New York. And they were into it, just as I was. So it was all about, at this point, we, we could nail the lighting. That was easy. It was about show. It was about making it look like the DJ running this had some mastery of the universe. It, it worked. Then I got lucky. Um, I went out to, uh, to San Francisco because I'd, after the after Electric Circus opened, I'd heard more and more about the San Francisco scene. And I wasn't that interested in the San Francisco scene as, because all the media were talking about it. What I was interested in was these ballrooms because the ballrooms were big, empty ballrooms that a light show came in. And with the greatest bands in the world, the light show would provide essentially all the illumination. I went out there. I, I was fascinated with the light. I didn't care for the San Francisco people so much. They, they had this kind of expression on their face. They were kind of blissed. They thought this was the best thing, and it was great. And I, I could see what wasn't right about it, but I could also appreciate the fact that they were all having a really good time. So, we, so anyway, Bill Graham is doing this show. He's been invited to Toronto, and now it is the Summer of Love. And he's been invited to Toronto to do a show uh, with uh, what were then relatively young groups, but famous in San Francisco, the, uh, <clears throat> the Jefferson Airplane and, um, and the Grateful Dead. 
And, uh, and they were young, really young. Uh, it's hard to believe. And if you think they're young, look at the Grateful Dead. That's young. Uh, and they, um, and, and, but they were he was supposed to bring the whole package with him, the ballroom and everything. The only, the only problem was that they were bringing it to this place, which is a very solid, stable theater, big theater with uh, a, a lovely acoustics and very formal seats. And it was, it was like the opposite of, of the scene that they represented. Uh, and they were, uh, they, they had brought in their, uh, they, they brought in their people, and this was the view from the balcony, and the light show said, no problem, Bill, it was Bill Graham, we can, we'll just close off the front, of, front three rows of this balcony, we'll set up our light show, and it'll be cool. Uh, now, you have to remember to go back to San Francisco, these were the ballrooms, and now look at where the light show wanted to work in San Francisco, in, in Toronto. Right up there, they wanted to just kill this whole balcony. And we're talking about eight shows, and that's thousands and thousands of dollars. And the light show from, from San Francisco dug in their heels and said, no, man, this is how we do it. We, we've always done it this way. Uh, and so it fell to me and my company to come up with alternate devices. And we came up with something that was not unknown to these people, but nobody ever thought of it on this big scale, which was simply to put a giant rear projection screen here and put them behind it. Then they, they liked that so much, Bill Graham liked that, he asked us if we could do things on the side. We said, sure, and we hung some more screens on the side. And then we, we, we didn't know anything about light shows. We just knew how to throw light around and how to control it. So he, uh, we ended up, uh, up sort of upstairs in a, little, uh, in a little tiny room throwing light. And the results were really quite nice. I mean, there's your San Francisco light show being projected on a rear screen. Um, Here's what it looked like. This is the rear project. This is us. Uh, I'll show you where we actually we projected out of these little tiny rooms here, <laughs> and we'd throw across. But our images could fly around the room, so it created a sense of San Francisco, and I think we we have more. Yeah, and uh, the one thing that I began to notice was that they really didn't have any appreciation or sense of meaning the San Francisco Light Show of the space of, of the space they're working in. These are all the projector outlines and. And I was forced to light the show. Now, lighting the show meant that I sat in the back row and I talked on a headset to a guy running a board. And I would change the wash on stage from red to green, back to red again. That was lighting. But I had to sit there and I listened and I watched for eight performances. And when it was over, um, I, I, just, I was just in love. I was just in love with the light show. And I made a lot of efforts to meet and communicate with headlights who were the San Francisco group. It was these two guys not knowing that they hated each other and they were literally breaking up behind the screen. One of them uh, was this fellow Glenn McKay and Glenn, he was much more jovial and he, he came back to New York with us and we made a deal. He would show, yeah, this is his light show. Sorry, you can play it. This is what Glenn's light show looked like. A little, a little pandery, but, it, but it, it, people like, like that a lot. And uh, he came back to New York with us, and he taught us the techniques of mixing liquids. That was what he could contribute, and the art of light show. We taught him how to mount a color wheel on a motor on a stand. And so it was a really good, we did the mechanical stuff for him. He gave us really the secrets, and I liked him a lot. He, was, uh, he, was, uh, a, a, he became a, a good friend. Uh, I always like to see him. I'd see him once every six months. It would always be a different girlfriend. Uh, th this, this was Marianne, who, who we first met, and she turned out to be a very good light show artist on her own, heavy water. Uh, but Glenn was just constantly coming and bringing dope with him, and just jolly. He was just jolly all the time. And he taught me uh, how you mix the colors. He, he opened up his kit. He let me look inside. Well you know, this was what I wanted to do. So, so I ended up quickly learning how to mix the Druid fluids. The, uh, the, the secret of liquid light shows, which I'll tell you in a moment, is, um, is basically that, uh, that you, you take an overhead projector, common overhead projector, and you, you take two clock faces that curve, and you put oil, colored oil and colored water in the bottom. No matter how much you stir them up, they'll never mix. They'll, they'll, always, they'll, they'll fall apart, but when they come back together, they'll separate. And that's the core liquid light effect. That's what everybody remembers. Uh, it was great to see the press try to describe in words what you couldn't. So it was a lot of exploding caviar, uh, uh, technicolor vomit. I mean, they were all over the place trying to explain it. But it was really quite beautiful. I'll also let you in on a secret, which is that I had no gifts for it. 
whereas uh, people in the light show had tremendous gifts for it. We also had, uh, had slides. And eventually, we formed a sort of ad hoc group. Here we are, just at the very beginning, with a sign we sort of stuck on. There I am, uh, and in a moment, you'll see me with a mustache, because I wanted to look older, if you could imagine that. Uh, and I went back in my mind to revisit good old, good old sense effects again. And just to look at this now, I really was angry. Not angry, but I hated it. I just didn't like it. And I, I didn't want to have to do this anymore. I wanted to do this. And furthermore, I wanted to create a perception of what we were for the audience, because they couldn't see us. So we began to take on this sort of narrative of, of who we are. It was, we were never lying, but it was, it was much more uh, on point, and it also it connected much, much better with the audience. I got lucky again in, uh, after we had the success with Bill. He didn't want to open a theater in New York, but we got a job. We got our first job in Long Island uh, with, uh, there we are on the poster, which I'm very proud of. And it was good, good acts and Ravi Shankar, but it was really the mothers of invention. And I had learned at this point to, to, to uh, all, always take pictures, you know, to, to always record it, because it must have taken 100 shots to get one that looks good, but this one looks great. And it's, it's really represented the light show ever since. I also did artistic things, because again, I'd studied art in colleges. Is one of the things that always irritated me was that the, the, the most light shows would just shoot people or people dancing or a, a lot of, of, of nude women with, uh, doing cartwheels. And that was OK, but it wasn't very good. Not, not the, their films weren't so bad, but the, but the women were clumsy. And I hated that. I, would, I could see it. So we hired artist models, and we shot our own stuff, and, uh, and, and were able to, to quickly uh, put it into the light show. So you can see how very gently it's mixed into the middle there. And, and we developed this whole uh, technique of, did I just see what I just saw, or did I not see what I just saw? It, it's, it was really just part of, the, part, part of what I think we did that was good. Um, <clears throat> I can show you what the early rig looked like. There's me. This is all carousel projectors. These are color wheels made out of hula hoops, because that was all we could think of uh, at the time. And we're on a scaffold and a platform. But, but the people like Bill here, who was really a genius, got better and better, took more control of it. I still sucked. But, uh, but I, I, I created the environments in which they could uh, in which, in which they could work. And I looked out for everybody. And I had very specific, uh, specific jobs myself. One of them was slides. Oh, this is the liquids that, that they began to make. You can see why it was really hard to find the words. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to stop here for a moment and show you some footage. It's more modern, but it does show what the light show looks like. Watch it for a minute or two. And it's uh, a show we did at the planetarium, but we made a special diptych version of it. You'll notice the Thomas Wilford in the police that's the Columbia up there. We still, I still didn't know how we did it, but people are waving, waving around their wrists in front of the projectors and dropping the coins. And, and the planetarium was like the greatest place I've ever worked in, except it's up there. But if you're ever, if any of you are ever offered a light show in the planetarium, call me and we'll, we'll do it. I, I'll go anywhere if it's a planetarium. But in order to fill out the space, you can see a lot of these weird that's pure Thomas Wilford. I didn't have to explain Wilford. Um, I just showed them how, how to do it. And, uh, and anybody can do it. Whether you do it well or not is a whole other story. But the people I work with are practiced on this. And it's not, it's not a secret. It's not a secret. So our light show was basically built on, uh, on several what we call the, the pillars. Uh, one, was, uh, one was slides. Slides. There was a wall of slides behind me. Over time, there was a thousand. I could put one in a projector and slide it on the screen. I knew just where everything was because we were there every weekend. You know, we did four shows a weekend plus other shows. And so, if in the abstraction, uh, Grace Slick is singing White Rabbit, we can bring a white rabbit on. We didn't stick it in the center and do color wheels like the zigzag man that you saw. We just, it just came on and then went off. And again, it was, did I see it? Did I not see it? So uh, Lumia liquids, uh, and I'll explain more about Lumia in a moment because it connects to Wilford. Um, uh, and uh, 
this is just samples of slides, and I knew where everything was. We also, because there was a lot of delays, uh, technical problems, we developed a sense of humor, and the light show actually, that's, be, that's not the humor, that's the humor. Uh, and we would do things like that. That was a classic uh, moment, because in the old days when the sound systems were still new, it was common for people to go, test, test. It was like a rhythm. And if they did it too many times, bam. And we, we, we would entertain the audience with signs and, and things. Uh, I talked about the liquids, and I talked about the signs. This is Lumia. Now, again, we didn't know how Wilfred did it, but I knew how it looked. And we had one person, Tom, who worked with us, and he focused on that. And it, it's almost impossible to show him um, doing it, but I'll show you some other shots that just show where he took a mirror and he had his own light sources and he would do effects. He could do anything. He could make birds fly. He sat up all alone on that, on that platform. I think we actually have a, yeah, that, remember this shot? That was Tom's place. It began with our first show where he didn't have anything to do, so I gave him some mirror and three colored lights, and it turned into this massive freestanding Lumia, which he occasionally would go out and perform with, with other artists. It was, it was very uh, inspiring. Let's just uh, look at some more pictures. That's a, a perfect example of how beautiful it was. The press began to notice us, which was very nice for me personally, but it was also good for, for the theater and everything. And you know, to be 25 and have an article in the Sunday Times, I, I mean, that was cool. I, I really was grateful for that. Um, we, so we worked with, with all the great bands. Um, just go ahead, Jamie. This is a, a perfect example where it's, it's a very grainy picture, but you know who that is. And that's an eye, which is a loop that's opening and closing. And uh, this is an example of pure color, which is the fourth part of the light show, is we used a lot of just pure color to mount things on. There's a perfectly classic Illumia running, running up and down in it. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it's, it's cute. Um, oh, it, yeah, OK. And Bill Graham, God bless him, he loved us. I mean, he loved us because we were professional, we were theatrical. And I got to tell you, the light shows in, in San Francisco made him crazy. They, they, they just were, they, they were on a completely different wavelength than Bill. But Bill, who was a, uh, a Holocaust survivor, came to America as a child, spoke flawless English, uh, and loved music. And he loved the light show. And he just treated us with so much respect. And I will always be grateful to, to Bill for everything that, that he did for us, which was basically give us a gig and pay us money and put us on the poster in the marquee. I'm not sure there's anything else in life. Uh, it's just another shot. We'll just run through some shots now so you can see what it looked like. And when the Fillmore opened, we all had to pitch in and help. Uh, and I did various jobs other than set up a light show, because it opened like in three weeks. I volunteered to fix the marquee. And, uh, <laughs> and what you can see is I've literally just climbed off the ladder. I'm standing behind Bill. And you'll notice what the marquee says. And I was, you know, I did that <laughs> just because I could. And I got away with it for a long time. Finally, they, they needed the marquee space, so I got a sign of my own. But that was a wonderful bit of mischief that I, that I uh, have never, ever regretted. Meanwhile, you remember Tim Leary and the first time I saw a light show? Well, the irony of this, of course, is that it's the same theater. It's the Village Theater. It was going to be called the Village Theater, but the man who owned that brilliant title said, you, if you open your rock palace and call it the Village Theater, I'll sue you. So they said, fine, Fillmore East, which was one of the great choices uh, of all times. Uh, now, notice the seats, same problem here. Uh, seats, which was very good in the sense that the audience had to sit down. Now, I'm not saying a ballroom isn't great, but the audience, their, their first function was to find their seat and sit down. There were reserved seats, there were ushers, because theater people were involved, everything was done the, the right way. The light, the light show screen, um, I've just, oh, we're looking now out at the theater, which, which is, is fine. The light show screen would be in the same place, and we were able to get some pretty terrific, terrific looking, uh, looking things here. Plus, we got to be on the poster, which is always wonderful. People ask me if I collect a lot of stuff. And you, you must have an amazing collection of posters, because this poster sells for thousands. And the answer is no, I have mine. I saved everything, but I, did, I wasn't a collector. And I have no regrets. But uh, we, uh, 
we, we just, it just got better and better. Oh, and, and th that's just a nice shot of the marquee. I'm just bragging now. Uh, and, uh, but I'll show you some more pictures, and then we will bring this to an end. And what's this? This is Gombrock. Okay, there's Janice. Certain how, it's interesting how certain performers of that era, you just kind of know who they are. You don't, you don't know uh, everybody, but you, know, you kind of recognize them. And this shows the physical relationship. I just wanted you to see it because I'm doing a lecture. This is the light show platform on the back wall. This is the edge of the screen. So that's how much room there was backstage. And in front are all the musicians playing. Sometimes it, uh, I, I want a, a new subject, because sometimes it, it got a little precious. There was still a lot of, of social confusion about were we mellow yellow or were we you know, hard southern Allman Brothers rock. And, uh, and so I, I, I saved a few flat things, and one of them is, is just this wonderful, totally from a different place sticker that somebody wanted to have made and made. But in the end, Bill Graham, Bill Graham, he had taste and he had judgment, and he was, he was uh, just the best. I have a, just a few more views and a bit of ephemera. This is the kind of thing I collect. They hadn't booked the act yet, but they had to start selling the tickets, and the only thing they knew was the Joshua Light Show. So I have a Joshua Light Show ticket, which is one of my treasure things. But I'm proud. I'm proud to, to have done this. And it was just luck and luck and timing. Uh, and th they were just the best, the best bands. And here's what the, the, the big rig ended up looking like. This is Tom up here. We've now built brand new overhead projectors that are much more powerful, much bigger to work on, and have multiple light sources in them. Um, there I am back there with my mustache to look older. It looked like Dickie Smothers. It didn't work at all. Uh, but it was interesting because later on I saw this picture of Wilfred's theater from 50 years earlier, and of course it's very similar. He had a theater that he projected on, and the idea of piling up all these projectors is exactly what we did without knowing about, about this. But it, it, it was such an influence on me. Uh, keep going. This just shows the scale. It shows how big the damn screen was. It, part of that was fun. This one I love because it's just a terrible photograph, but yet you know everything about it. And, and if I can do that, uh, then I'm, you know, I, I, you can close the lid. I'm, I'm fine at this point. Uh, again, uh, we also, we, we were literally on record albums, if you could believe that. I mean, we get a credit. There's photographs uh, of the light show. Uh, just who, whoever thought we'd be on, not just a record album, but like a gold, a gold record album. I, I'm sorry to keep bringing you back to this, but I'm, I can only draw upon the things that I, that I have. Uh, let me show you um, a, sca a scale again. This is my wife, Bridget, and that gives you some idea of how big these, these screens were. Here's, here it is from the other side. This isn't the film where this is something more modern, but again, it's, it was a wonderfully big surface to work on. We began small, um, and we developed things beautifully small. We began to develop what was multimedia in the sense that Wait, go back, please. This, that's background slides with color moving around. That's a slide that I put up of the Statue of Liberty, and that's a film loop. And it's not a great photograph, but we did that constantly throughout the evening. We'd find some reference, and they're probably singing, it's probably Country Joe and the Fish, and they're probably singing The Feeling to Die Rag, or something like that, which was you know, a big, very satisfying song at the time. We also introduced video. 1969 was very black and white and very low low contrast, but the projector became available, the camera became available, so we tried it, and I was quite taken with it because the audience, I could feel the audience <clears throat> reacting to the concrete image that moved, and and once they realized it was Janice, they really loved it, so I filed I filed it away. Here's a few more pictures, and then we'll we'll move on to another great moment. Keep going. They're not all great pictures. The, the light show had many, 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 many looks. Um, then we got this call, OK? We got this call because uh, uh, John Schlesinger was making a movie to be called Midnight Cowboy. And they were looking for, the, they were trying to reach the Warhol people because they wanted the Warhol people to stage a party for them. Well, that's not what the Warhol people did. Uh, they really couldn't, I don't know how they got dressed in the morning, but they couldn't even answer the phone. I mean, they just could not reach them or one person who could guarantee. So what they did was they hired us to replicate a Warhol party, which we were prepared to do. I'd been there. Uh, and then they hired, the and the light show was on a balcony, and they hired uh, Warhol people to come and be 
more whole people, and it worked out very well. Also, because of my training uh, at USC Film School, I was able to, to use a lot of hamburger helper to make the light show seem bigger than it was. And one trick we did was we'd put lighting effects right on the camera. That's the camera. Oh, oops, sorry. That's the camera up there. That's uh, a reflective light, and there's an overhead projector. So we would, like that picture of Dustin Hoffman, that wasn't, that we came up and we set that. And because I had been to USC Film School and was able to bond with the, the, the old union guys who were running the cameras, I, I even at one point loaded the camera with my eyes shut just to prove that I was a brother rat. And it came out, it came out looking great, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful film. And they put us on the opening title. Take a look at a quick scene. reaching out into space sometimes. I've watched it touch many stars. Wackles, they're all wackles. So you, you can almost, they, they, these are all, these are all, uh, uh, they, they, we had such a good time doing this. It took 10 days to shoot this one, you see it. Uh, and we just gave the material, and I'll see if I can point out where, where all that you think there's a lot of light going on, but it's just somebody back there with a the mirror. He's not shining it on John Gordon, he's shining it in the camera. Take a walk. Take a shade. I'm just going to lick the sweater. <laughs> anyway, Midnight Cowboy. Uh, 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 now, I'm going to do like a big leap here because uh, I could go in. Uh, uh, just hold off on that. Uh, it's, uh, it can stay there. I, I uh, could, I'm going to do a big leap here because there was Woodstock. There was all, all kinds of things that Martin Luther King was assassinated just after we opened. There were so many big things. But this is about uh, me and my view of Wilford and just sharing with you experiences based on pictures that I could find. And, and a lot of the pictures I had because they meant something to me. So after we came back from Woodstock, I was trolling around for new technical ideas, things we could, we could put in. But in Woodstock, just to give you a sense, uh, at, at, at the Fillmore, the screen was this big and the theater was this big. At Woodstock, the screen was this big and it was like this. We made no impression. We might as well have not been there. Nobody knew we were there. Nobody could, I mean, it was like a postage stamp. It was all about people looking at each other, and I got that. And I sat on the stage with Bill Graham, and we talked about it. And both of us saw the end. But I needed to have more uh, other things, so I went to a trade show of multimedia, you know. And there was uh, a guy, a very dry guy, talking about the future of multimedia, and he used words like psychedelic and light show. And then they gave a demo of what their ideas were, and something like that was just really <laughs> was really discouraging because. In order to make any, any money to make the light show grow, I was going to have to do shit like that. And I just, I just wasn't going to. And you can see there's the stretch nylon cliche from the Electric Circus. They've just picked up all the things. But in the end, it's, it's a PowerPoint. And it, this is my first PowerPoint, and hopefully my last. But <laughs> it's, because it beca the, the, me the medium becomes the message. And, and I just, you know, it's not for me. But I also wanted to try out some new areas, and I'd remembered that the, that the video was very successful, so I moved to this, which was originally going to be an electronic light show in a place like Madison Square Garden. A lot of these bands were, just didn't want to play four nights for $25,000, do great shows. They'd rather play one lousy show in this awful place uh, and make $75,000, and now, of course, they make millions. But we put up a, uh, I put up a screen. I, left the light show, I formed a new company called Joshua Television, only to, to take, make use of, of the very goodwill that I'd had from the years at the Fillmore change. Um, and these were the projectors. I mean, you have no idea. And these were the backup projectors. I mean, if I were standing next to this projector, my head would be about here. It was just a nightmare, but it was better than any other nightmare. So we were able to do to do concerts, and it was at this, you can't quite see him, but it's this David Cassidy concert that I really learned about the power of this, because at the David Cassidy concert, uh, it was all uh, very, very young girls, and they would scream at everything he did. And I discovered if I shot a close-up of his ear, they would scream. 
whatever I shot, they would scream. So I realized that this is a very powerful medium. Uh, television, I thought there was something wrong with the idea that you go to a concert and you're hearing big sound and you're watching it on TV. But that's become the norm now. And it never quite got artful. It's beginning to move over into, into art now. I, it, to me, it still looks like this. But, you know, I, I have a right to complain. Uh, <clears throat> and I think, hang on one second. There's another deep cut coming here, I think. Anyway, so television, uh, it, it, by the early 70s, I had already been doing this for several years, and I picked up the skills of television and television directing. And television discovers rock and roll. They discovered they did big, big concerts out of doors. And the only person that was around that wasn't afraid of big crowds and that wasn't afraid of television at, for a moment was me. And so I could sit in a room with, with an angry, mean, union representative from ABC uh, who's trying to talk to the sound man. Did I do the sound man? Oh, I touched the microphone. Sound man for the Grateful Dead, who was also the guy who made their LSD. Uh, and I'm saying, well, what Mr. Owsley is saying is, you know, and I, I became this kind of Rosetta Stone. It wasn't forever, but I got to do some very, very, uh, very, very big, big shows. And uh, now comes another deep cut, fade out, it's 20 years later, fade in. Now I have, I have learned how to be a television director, and I have, I'm beginning to get these kind of jobs, and I was able to retire. These, now, all of a sudden, the stakes are high, and, and I was able to retire and return to light shows, which I, I just love. Um, I'll show you some of the things. This is a Lumia that I built for a museum in Roanoke. It's, uh, it, this is what people saw on the outside. Here's another view of it. That's the Lumia screen. This is where they could sit. Now, at the inside, we built a control panel that was based on a combination of Star Trek and NASA. Turntable, lights, you could run it from here. And kids could come in and make their own, make their own Lumia. Uh, the, 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 it's been a, a very interesting experience. The new light show, uh, I formed it again in, uh, in the uh, 2000, or like 2004. And usually, the life is uh, three or four years. I was expecting it to all fade away. But every time I turn around, there are, are newer people, younger people, who have deep interest in this. And it's, it's great for me to just step back and watch it. And uh, um, the, there's been a lot of rewards. Uh, but you remember the good old Museum of Modern Art where I would go upstairs? Well, this year, the Museum of Modern Art put the old original Joshua Light Show in their permanent collection. And it's there right now. It'll be there till the end of March. It's a show about the 60s. That's Bridget. That's me. And, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been great, and I have no intention of stopping. I have every intention of passing on as much information as I can, encouraging people, and, uh, and thanks to Thomas Wilfred, you know, I, he, he turned something on in me, and it's, it's going to be here. Thank you. Oh, we, we actually have time uh, for, for questions, I think. So uh, it's, I see 10 minutes on my clock, yes? What are your questions? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I see a hand almost going up, or she's checking the time. A ask, oh, maybe we are out of time. All right, one, one question. How about from you young people in the front row? How about a question? Speak up. <laughs> Thank you. I actually, uh, I, See, I can hear him. I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, the, uh, when a fan on, I, I, some of those buildings seem very familiar, like Savage and Buckley and those uh -huh. guys. Oh, well, there, there were lots of light shows. Uh, and uh, I, I, the, the, I know that the Leary uh, worked with artists uh, Rudy Stern and Jackie Casson, uh, who were, you know, they were equals uh, of Thomas Wilfred in terms of their importance. They were in that famous show that really turned me around. And there are light shows going out now. Uh, basically, we don't travel. Uh, we go, we'll go somewhere, but only if it's a festival or something that will underwrite the cost of bringing all that equipment. But I'm working with, uh, with all kinds of people. Uh, four of them are sitting in the second row. And they all, they'll, they'll go anywhere and do a light show. And it's great. It's just great. Yes? Did you, did you, tailor, did you tailor your shows to the different bands? Or was it pretty much 
across the board the same show no matter what band? It's a good question. I, I can give you the, 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 the answer is yes, it was the same show, but because we had a permanent location and we didn't have to deal with setting up, we would build up a palette and every uh, performance, the palette would get bigger and we'd remember everything and I'd remember everything. So each of the pieces of equipment that we use ended up with hundreds of variations. Uh, and that doesn't happen when you're constantly packing up. It, it was because we were there. So the answer is yes, we did the same thing, but it didn't look the same. We used the same techniques. The silence is deafening. Oh, I see people behind you, back there. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's free. Right. It's free. And, and okay. drop it. Drop it really hard. When <laughs> it's probably expensive. So, um, I'm an art director for Audubon Arts, uh, and I'm trying to do something interesting for the upcoming musical. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got, you're, you're the only person I can't hear, and you've oh. got the microphone. You're trying to do something different uh, for... For, um, uh, a, uh, for Audubon Arts. Um, it's, a, it's a theater program for uh, Neighborhood Music School. Um, what resources would you recommend uh, that I yeah. that I look into so that maybe I can do something yeah, I interesting? Would, I would, yes, yeah, so that's a, a good question. I would say if, if you're looking for one thing and you're an art director, that means you have the selective eye, which is good. And rather than try to do it yourself, I would talk to these four people in the front row now before you leave. Yeah, the, they're hard to miss. They're the only people in the front row. <laughs> uh, talk to them, or, to, or, or I, I can point you at things, but the best thing to do is to talk to people that are deeply immersed in it, and let them sell you or, uh, materials. Let them, let them make something for you. Th that you, you say what you're looking for, they make it, and you pay them. You know, uh, uh, that's, that's the best way. It's no different than hiring an illustrator. OK, thank you. I think we've, we've hit our, oh, wait a minute, please. Now, now they're getting hot now, OK. Um, so today, when I go to a concert, the lighting design is so different from what we saw on the screen just now. Mm -hmm. What trends do you identify in the 21st century in terms of light shows or lighting design in concerts? Good question. We are, we're in the middle of a sort of transition here because light shows were really of the 60s, and we were always considered part of the music business. We weren't taken seriously as artists, nor did we pursue that. But uh, about 15 years ago, younger curators began to focus on... Uh, on light shows as part of the art. I mean, for me, symbolically, to be standing up here in the Wilford context means, means a great deal. Uh, what happened is it went from no technology to too much technology. So everybody has moving lights, and they use them. Everybody has big video screens, so they use them. Smoke, they use it. Fireworks, they use it. Uh, but I am seeing a trend, and some of it was represented here, in, um, in performers who are not interested in that. They want to play. So they stand there almost in the dark, and I find myself for the first time saying, how about just a little light on you? Because light was always our enemy. It washed out our, I mean, look at this. That's, it could look like this. It just washed everything out. So I, I see the more respect there is for light shows, the more respect there'll be for light show artists. It won't be something you buy and plug in, which is what it is now. I, I see a very good future. It's, I think the spectacle part of it has always been there, but now there's, there's some real art coming from people who do not want to be surrounded by production. They want something subtle, and the light show is subtle. Well, okay then. Thank you so much.